The Philippine Nurses Association of Nevada now brings you Philippine Nars, news and features about the Filipino-American nursing community and beyond. And now, here's your host, Doris Bauer. Good evening, Philippine Nars listeners and followers. I hope you are keeping safe out there. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. We have a very spe special program uh, carved out for you today. We had the opportunity to meet with uh, Governor Steve Sisalak, and in his in this meeting, which was held at the SEIU, uh, we were at a roundtable discussion with the governor, and he was trying to find out what the personal experiences are of the nurses from the different field cares uh, healthcare settings that they are working at and give, the, give him suggestions and give him some insight on what we had done in the last year during this pandemic. So without further ado, we are going to show you the entire uh, discussion with Governor Sisolak. Thank you for joining. Steve Sisolak and uh, distinguished guests, good morning. <coughs> Thank you all for being here today, this morning. My name is Doris Bauer. I am the immediate past president of the PNAND, or the Philippine Nurses Association of Nevada. I did serve as a president from 2017 to February of 2021. First of all, I would like to thank SEIU for hosting and providing a meeting place for this very important event. Hey, Angelica and Edward, thank you so much. The SEIU has been working collaboratively with the PNAND over the years and has recently uh, with other organizations held an event to thank the nurses for their efforts in the midst of this pandemic. So thank you so much SEIU. Governor Sisolak, I think I can speak for the leaders and the members of the PNANB in letting you know how honored and humbled we are for your visit. Thank you for allowing us to show you how committed we are as nurses to do what we can for the community during this pandemic. And thank you, Governor, for trusting in medical science when you made those very tough decisions regarding this pandemic. Thank you. I'm also proud to say that the BNANB has been the most active and the most engaged professional nursing organization during this pandemic. And here to tell you about the BNANB's activities is our current president, Ms. Elizabeth De Leon Gamboa. Lisa, as we call her, has assumed the organization's presidency since February of this year. Lisa has a master's degree in nursing education and works as a case manager with Optum Care of Nevada Medical Management that provides services for the Medicare Advantage population. Ladies and gentlemen, Lisa Gamboa. Thank you very much, Doris, for that introduction. Good morning, Governor Sisolak and staff, ladies and gentlemen. I'm humbled to stand in front of you to represent our organization as the president of the Philippine Nurses Association of Nevada. The past two years have set before us many challenges and adversities brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic. We all lived in unprecedented times with countless uncertainties experiencing undue physical, emotional, financial, and mental health stress. We have seen so much devastation, not only from the economic standpoint, but also with the many lives we lost. Through it all, PNANB nurses have served as beacons of light and hope in various healthcare settings in our community. Guided by our motto, PNANB, strength, resilience, and resolve through unity. Let me now share with you the accomplishments of PNANB. We launched the Masks on Shields of Protecting Nevada together in June 2020, and it's still ongoing. To date, we have donated at least 3,500 handcrafted masks and shields combined to hospitals, nursing homes, home health, schools, and the public, most recently the U.S. vets, in response to the PPE shortage. This is a project that we continued uh, from the Bayanihan project of NAFA. The prayer group was established in April 2020 
as a support group for those infirmed with COVID-19 and their families, strengthening our faith. We have actively volunteered at the UNLV and ACDC COVID-19 vaccination clinics starting in April of 2021. We have provided three virtual continuing education programs. We have experts from Southern Nevada Health District, VA doctors, life coaches. They shared updates on healthcare initiatives and experiences related to COVID, dispelling the myths and fallacies about PPEs and vaccinations, while promoting self-care and mental health for nurses. Mind Body Strong was offered. This is a cognitive behavioral skills training course that provides tools on how to cope with the anxiety and stress, supporting the nurse's mental health. The mentorship program. We have paired seasoned nurses with the novice nurses to equip them with learning and coping strategies to face the rising demands on the nursing profession, especially during the pandemic. Food pantry and gifts of sharing in collaboration with various donors like CTK, Chefs for Vegas, and other donors, holiday meals were delivered to COVID-afflicted families. Give to Nurses campaign in collaboration with Massage NB, about 140,000 worth or 1,400 massage gift certificates were allocated to the frontline nurses who were assigned to COVID patients. And last but not the least, we also have the Philippine Nars podcast that is aired on PHLV radio that imparts unbiased information on relevant healthcare issues that impact our community, highlighting leaders, organizations, and their programs. Now I proudly present to you our board of directors and our members to share their experiences. Well, I would like to thank you for uh, taking time, Governor, to hear us out today. My name is Loy Gamboa. I work at, uh, as a nurse as a, on RN in the birth care unit at UMC. Fear, frustration, anxiety, stress, depression, disappointment. All these, that's how I felt during the height of the pandemic, especially the first two waves. Fear of contracting the virus at work and infecting my family. I was frustrated from limited PPEs at work and everywhere else. I was full of anxiety. I was stressed out from going to work every day. Although I work in burnt ICU, we are not supposed to have patients with COVID, but we have few burn patients who were tested positive after we had a direct, con uh, direct care of contact with them. And eventually we transferred them to the appropriate units. We were also mandated to work overtime and floated to other units to take care of COVID patients. Search units were open. We have to be creative on how to maintain throughout to care for our patients. And I usually quarantine myself from my family when, I, when that happens for weeks, meaning sleeping alone. There's no good night kiss from my wife nor my uh, son. It was emotionally draining. I was emotionally drained, causing depression, uh, disappointment. We are all trying our best to contain the virus, but there are still a lot of people who doesn't want to follow the right protocol. In time, our communication got better about supply changes, visitor policies, processes for COVID infections in the department and patients, communication about vaccination requirements and wanting to respect their choice. Uh, we provided education and support to encourage the vaccinations. Thank you. I am Amber Sambo, a nurse practitioner and the uh, uh, vice president of the Philippine Nurses Association of Nevada. Governor Sisalak, when you mandated the lockdown way back, I think of March of 2020, our group launched what you call the mask and face shield project and when you say ready to use mask the board already iron sewn and wash the mask that we have mm -hmm. and they are beautifully done by the board itself we have a lot that we did 
and we are really very happy. A lot of the patients and the nurses, because of the scarcity of masks at the time, they use this to go home and also in the hospital. They wash this, they put it in, and then they put the regular mask. So we really did help a lot. And then we went through with the face shield and we adapted the project of Dr. J10 to make it the shield that we did to protect ourselves for the flash and things like that in the hospital. Unfortunately, I got afflicted with COVID. And um, when I went home, I went to sort of depression because I cannot walk from here to that door. I had shortness of breath and I have an oxygen. And my thought was that, what am I going to do now? I'm very young. Uh, I can go back to work. And so the, this group of uh, my members and family of PNA and B text me, call me, and said, don't worry of texting me back. Just improve yourself. And as a nurse practitioner, it dawned on me that I have to take care of me before I can take care of everyone else. So in a cardboard, I write there, time to sleep, time to wake up. And when you're in depression, you need to put yourself time to brush your teeth. It's really, really hard for me um, to learn to forgive myself that at that day, I will be able to do it, but rest, and tomorrow is another day. And uh, so, for those that had continued symptoms in the community, what you are feeling for those symptoms are true. But what my advice is, please be patient to yourself and continue to make that step towards improvement with your doctor and yourself. And now that I'm back after five months of COVID symptoms, I am very happy that I'm back with a PNA and moving with a mask and facial project. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. That was inspiring. Good morning, Governor. And to my BFF and your office, Sharina. <laughs> Hi, Sharina. My name is Minda Banaria. I'm a retired nurse from UNC. I had worked as a nurse for 43 years. Mm. Now don't ask me my years? age. <laughs> <laughs> oh. But although retired, I still remain very active with the community. I've been an officer with the PNA, where we, during this pandemic, COVID-19 pandemic, we were so active in, um, uh, giving out food, masks, like there is to our uh, frontliners and community. Uh, the PNA also partnered with NAFA, you're familiar with the uh, big Filipino organization. We did our Bayanihan project where we also served the frontliners, distributed food and masks, and a lot of the hospitals and um, transitional care um, facilities. Um, aside from that, I was very, I'm very active with the faith community. I'm a very active at Christ Speaking Church where you are a member. Uh, last November, we did an outreach where we gave out food and masks. About 150 people came and Availed that food and mass distribution. Also, with the Bayanihan project, we continued to give masks up to the present and some of uh, the COVID uh, afflicted patients. The PNA group also um, created a prayer group, which we um, started last March 2020 and up to the present. We still pray for all those afflicted and died of COVID-19. And um, they, because we are very active, everybody calls us. Every night we have a full list of people that we pray for. And I'm so proud of the PNA group doing that great project. Thank you. Thank you.
Good morning, especially to our honorable guest, Governor Sisolak. I am Cesar Noel Estiliore, a medical frontliner, specifically a nurse practitioner and a COVID survivor. It was last year of March 2020, I was diagnosed with severe COVID infection. I was intubated for three weeks, became septic, and with pulmonary embolism, with acute kidney injury, and I had massive GI bleeding, but I survived. Doctors in Summerlin Hospital called me the miracle boy. After two months in hospital and rehab, I was discharged home, but I'm disabled. I was disabled. Initially, I was an oxygen and a walker. My whole right lung is totally scarred up to the present. But with God's grace and prayers and with excellent medical care, I am COVID-free and a survivor. Fully vaccinated, more importantly, an advocate for vaccination against COVID-19. I would like to inspire others to follow my advocacy to fight this pandemic. I am committed to serve our fellow Las Vegas uh, residents who need in dire needs of medical assistance. Presently, starting March 2021, I'm back to work. I work as a provider, as an internal medicine, as well as pain management in eight several uh, rehab facilities. First, and I also visit patients who are homebound uh, in the community and also support their medical needs through my newly, comp through my newly uh, formed company, the Visiting Providers of Nevada. And I thank you for this uh, um, event that I could share my testimony to all of you, especially to you, the um, Honorable uh, Cicela, uh, Governor Cicela. Good morning, Governor. Good morning, everybody present. My name is Michael Collins. I'm a retired registered nurse. Uh, I've worked at UMC from 1987 until uh, July of 2020. In March of 2020, uh, when the pandemic overtook uh, our state and the and the everything closed down essentially, the hospital came to us and told uh, told us that there were 450 of us that were eligible for retirement. And if we retire, because the economy had shut down, they didn't know how the revenue stream would work. Uh, if we retire, that would prevent them from having to lay off uh, at least 450 people. So I, I did retire. And uh, so uh, I sat around uh, trying to adjust to retirement. It was very boring. <laughs> and in December, uh, 2020, as the vaccinations became available to my former co-workers, I, I, I got COVID. And uh, I still have some some long COVID symptoms, uh, but uh, like several other members of PNA, I survived. I've been a member of PNA for about seven years. And uh, in March, uh, when uh, Lisa put out the call for people to come and volunteer at of vaccination clinics uh, at Shanghai Village, I jumped on the opportunity because uh, I can't think of anything that's more urgently needed in our society in Nevada at this time than to get as many shots and norms as possible. So, uh, Governor, I really want to thank you for your forward thinking and really tough decisions you made early on. Uh, it saved, uh, I would say it saved thousands of lives. We really appreciate you. And I really appreciate an opportunity to be a part of an organization that has been uh, right on, on the front line in fighting this uh, uh, pandemic. Thank you. Good morning, Governor, and uh, the guests in here. 
Thank you so much for the opportunity, and I know you've heard so many thank yous, but I, I can thank you enough for all the efforts that the, your leadership has done for our state. By the way, my name is Christy Sample, and I'm a happily retired registered nurse. Uh, I'm happy because, you know, you get to sit around, and every day is a Saturday. <laughs> so, uh, however, like what Mike said, I wasn't bored because I was busy doing a lot of things for my own personal thing. However, it got to a point when pandemic hits us that it affected globally. I said to myself, what am I doing at home when I can be of help? So with a mask on, shields up, I got my husband and my mom to get involved doing the face shields. And to tell you, Governor, blistered in my fingers because of the, yeah. you know, those black <laughs> things. I was the one who was doing that. But it did stop me from being active with the PNA because PNA had been in my heart. I, I served as past president for, uh, you know, for several years also. And currently I'm the auditor. And I got involved with this retarded, they call, we call them ourselves retarded, <laughs> the retirees. It doesn't really retard you from doing things. It depends on what you want to do. So we remain active, and almost the same time last year, when the, uh, the uh, cases of uh, COVID really was affecting our frontliners, the entire family. So we had to uh, coordinate with Child Christ the King, and we packed bags and bags of goodies to be delivered to the homes we don't, uh, you know, we don't have a direct contact, but we just leave them on their doorsteps for them to pick up the food. And uh, even the non-frontliners, the casino workers, we delivered a couple of uh, families, and of course, our, uh, you know, the healthcare providers. We delivered a lot, and um, it made us feel better. And uh, at our very small effort that we could have impacted you know, to the community. And we will continue to do and inspire other people to be active. Even if you're retarded, you can still remain active. Thank you so much, Governor. Hello again, Governor. Uh, I'm Norris Bauer. Uh, at the start of the pandemic, I worked as a nurse manager for a home infusion company. Today, I have a much larger role as a regional nurse manager for Option Care. The field that I'm working with uh, serves patients who need care and infusion services or in, in, intravenous services in the home setting. I'm also in touch with nurses who work with home health agencies. The pandemic was a very huge challenge for the healthcare workers that work in the home care setting. The only guidelines on how to handle a pandemic, especially COVID, uh, from the CDC at the time were for the acute care services or the hospitals and some guidelines for businesses. But it quickly became evident that this was a more, more of a community spread virus. The home health agencies and us were not prepared for the issues that came about, which were, to name a few, uh, establishing staff protocol for infection control for a pandemic, the lack of PPE, the lack of availability of PPE, controlling and handling nursing staff exposure uh, who got COVID. Staffing shortage also became a bigger issue as the pandemic continued. Nurses who became ill could not be replaced. Nurses and the healthcare workers were quitting to protect themselves and their families. Nurses were recruited for travel jobs that paid a lot of money than the smaller agencies that could afford to pay, hence the continued lack of staffing. As a home care home infusion manager and other managers, we did what we could to create our own agency policies and procedures for COVID infection control based upon some guidelines set by the CDC and the health district. Personally, I made many phone calls to colleagues to get their input, experience, and possible solutions. PPE was an issue, and as agencies who were considered small potatoes, 
we did not have the buying power to secure PPE. They were also not readily available. And this is why I was happy when the BNA and B initiated the masks and face shields project. And even if the homemade masks and face shields were not up to medical COVID standards, it provided some kind of a protection to the healthcare workers and the community in caring for non-COVID patients. The PNANB donated mass and facials to home health agencies and other uh, agencies like uh, was mentioned before, and this was pretty much appreciated. And I know I did my own share of sewing, I'm still doing it. <laughs> the PPE uh, situation has much improved, and we are dealing with staffing, still dealing with staffing shortage. So thank you for this opportunity. I also wanted to, uh, you to know that I am the uh, host of the podcast for PNA and the Philippine Arts, where we showcase the healthcare issues of the community. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Governor Sisolak. Um, I'm also a retired nurse. I retired pretty young, up 52. Not bad, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so it's been six years now, um, but that has not stopped me from uh, taking care of uh, giving care to the community as well. When we did the mass and face shields project, um, I didn't really have that time to do the sewing, so I reached out to um, my parishioners over at St. Elizabeth and Seton, and I even involved the Vietnamese sisters to do them. And um, on the um, the part we're in, we were giving out food to the uh, uh, COVID patients. There was a time where there was only one person who was affected in, in, in that household. And then after a few months, we learned that the whole uh, members of the family are, are uh, affected. So it, it was really in a dire need for us to drive and uh, drop off the food to the families that probably would sustain them for the whole two weeks that they are uh, in seclusion, in isolation. Um, the thing that really affected me is that um, for those people who have not been vaccinated yet, um, I have a friend who, who has five sisters and um, they decided not to be vaccinated. They were living in the same household and it is just so sad and, and um, I'm still kind of like angry about it, that um, in a matter of two weeks time, all those five sisters died. Yeah, they, they succumbed to COVID. And it's still really important for us, I think, um, to uh, let people know the importance of, of getting this vaccination. Um, we still have a few out there um, who are just not going to take it. You know, they have their own reasons, but uh, we just pray. We've so far, it's been 20 months, we've, we've been praying since March, and I usually have the list of the names of the people who have uh, uh, died of COVID, and the list just goes on and on. I mean, I counted at one point, and we've, been, we've prayed for over 200 who have died and over 400 who are sick, who were sick. Mm -hmm. So, you know, with the prior power of prayer, you know, we, we know that God is hearing us. I see you as that you all are my heroes because I know how hard it is to work through this pandemic and then to think about, you know, um, your families back home. A lot of nurses, a lot of healthcare workers in, in this state of Nevada are immigrants and refugees. And I like to, you know, to say that, you know, without the contributions of, of skilled immigrants and refugees, the healthcare system of Nevada will not run um, as well as it, it does. So I just want to say thank you. And then Filipino Salamat. Um, yeah. Super, super thankful for you guys. And uh, always, um, off the Office for the Americans is here for your continued collaboration. Thank you. And I'm uh really honored to be with you today and humbled to listen to a lot of your uh, comments. And, uh, boy, a lot of years of nursing put in around this table. You know, I can't even imagine hundreds of years that have been uh, dedicated to the field of nursing. 
But I want to begin by thanking you on behalf of the great state of Nevada and the three million people, as I say, that call Nevada home. Thank you for providing such an essential and crucial service during this pandemic to help so many people, to help save so many lives along the way. And you're right, we have had to make some difficult decisions every single day. But you've implemented those and helped save those lives. When I hear the story about five siblings all died, that's just absolutely devastating to have that type of a, uh, a situation where they were affected so tragically. And uh, I have tried to follow the science the entire time through this pandemic. And well, there's a lot of haters out there, and that's the problem with the internet and the anonymity of posting stuff online and not even saying who you really are. Uh, this pandemic has seen brought up the worst in people and the best in people at the same time. I know that the uh, Philippine Nurses Association has been there for providing food, providing testing services, providing vaccination services, helping with patients and losing a lot of patients. And I've said a lot of times when, uh, especially around Thanksgiving last week, you know, I had the honor, I got to have dinner with my daughters and my wife and my mom and uh, my sister. And there's a lot of, almost 8,000 empty seats around dinner tables in the state of Nevada as a result of this virus. 8,000 uh, that are preventable. A lot of them would have been preventable. And I appreciate what you're doing to encourage people to get vaccines and to spread the word about vaccines because ultimately this is a pandemic of the unvaccinated. You know, the ones that are getting, I keep hearing from our nursing professionals, our medical professionals, that the ones that are getting into the ICU units, the ones that are going on vents, are ones that oftentimes didn't get vaccinated, they didn't get boosted for one reason or another, whether it was a medical religion, their hesitancy, uh, medical objection rather, their hesitancy, their resistance, uh, religious objection, whatever it might be. The fact is the vaccines save lives, not just their lives, but family lives and our economy, to get our economy open back up again so people can go back to work and support their families, which is crucially important. We are closer to the end, I believe, of this pandemic than we are to the beginning, but I think our lives have changed forever as a result of this. Uh, what you've done with making masks and sewing and, and doing that has been incredible in terms of providing that level of security and that level of safety for folks. Uh, I know that we are in a desperate shortage for nurses and uh, medical providers. Uh, we're doing what we can. Uh, it's not a situation that's going to be resolved overnight. I know that the stress and the mental anguish that this has put on a lot of individuals has caused them to leave the profession early because they are concerned and they don't want to take this home to themselves and or their families if they catch it. And uh, I guess I, I guess I want to thank you for what you've done, but I've got a few minutes left. I'd like to ask for your help. Uh, if you've got some suggestions that you can give me in terms of what we can do, we have tried everything to get people vaccinated. We've run announcements, we've made mobile clinics, we brought it into neighborhoods, we brought it to houses of worship, we brought it to doctor's offices, we had raffles, we had lotteries, we gave out stuff. I don't know if you've got a suggestion of what we can do to get people and more people vaccinated. We're still in the low 60 percentages. I mean, that means almost 40 people out of 100 have not gotten the vaccine, which is what causes these cases to continue on and on and on. So I guess I'm just asking you, do you have some suggestions you can give me in terms of what we've done wrong or what we haven't done or what we could do better to encourage people to maybe get vaccinated? Anybody's got a suggestion? I guess advertisement in the media would be the best. I mean, um, just uh, everyday advertisements of promoting vaccination and testimonies of other people in the media, in the television, every day would spread the word. Because not we're doing the right thing right now, but I guess when I watch TV, it's always commercial, commercial, commercial of, you know, advertisements of co all the big corporations, but not on vaccination. I guess since this is a pandemic and lives are being lost every day, especially those who are unvaccinated, mass media promotion every day would be the best thing. And also, I mean, you need to get people who
who had, you know, experienced uh, COVID and promote a voxy of vaccination and wearing masks and hand washing. Those are the three things that I guess would hamper uh, the spread of COVID and promote uh, vaccination as a way of uh, impeding uh, COVID infection. Okay. Uh, go ahead, Mike. Go ahead. Uh, Governor, since like I don't know how effective the previous lottery was uh, in getting people uh, in for their shots, but um, I was thinking maybe a holiday lottery uh, to encourage folks to uh, get shots it would could uh, influence a, a certain amount of folks to come in and get vaccinated. Okay. I mean, the story that you had about five siblings. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. If that doesn't touch someone, mm -hmm. you know, I, mean, I don't know what's yeah. going to. Yeah. I mean, that's just absolutely yeah. devastating. It's the whole family's wiped out. They just had a memorial of the three sisters, and there were still two who were in the hospital. And the following week, both of them died. So it's like, oh my gosh, you know, <laughs> my poor friend. It, it is, um, it is. Governor, last month I attended a concert at Smith Center. I was so impressed, thousands of people, they got checked with their vaccination card and the, all through the concert, mass was worn. But I see in TV, we have a lot of sports activities yeah. here. They don't wear masks. Yeah. So maybe there's a way you could do that they would impose on wearing masks if they <coughs> that, have that, all this is for. That's a very good point. I'll address that. The uh, Legion Stadium for the football games, yeah. uh, they will not let them in without a vaccine. I mean, that was the reason that the masks came off for the stadium because that was the way we got 65,000 people vaccinated because they had to be vaccinated in order to go into a game. Uh, that's the only stadium that has that requirement that you have to be vaccinated. For the hockey team, I've gotten complaints as a, uh, with T-Mobile that people are not masked and they don't have to be vaccinated. Uh, I talked to them yesterday, in fact, their representatives, to encourage them to start enforcing it or we were going to have to enforce mm -hmm. it. So hopefully they will take, because it doesn't take much. It takes one or two people in there and it's spreading it to hundreds of thousands MGM of people. concerts. I and see concerts, they don't yeah. have masks. Well, can I? Because I watch one of the major concerts, uh, Bruno Mars, and what? My wife loves Bruno Mars. <laughs> <laughs> I do too. You do too, okay. <laughs> Fidel. Uh, but the thing is, and I've watched two major concerts at T-Mobile. Sadly, their tricks, you know, the concert goers, they will buy drinks and food. And you will see their masks. And no matter how much I love to buy popcorn, I really, I just buy candy and I eat it because I don't want to remove my mask. These people, I watch them the entire event no. with their drink, okay? And we are like packed here. They never wore masks because that's their, um, excuse. what you call it? Excuse. Yeah, excuse not to wear masks. I have a drink, okay? But I think we could do better, like what you said, if we would mandate all the events, because we have a lot of events here in Las Vegas to, to show their cards, uh, you know, immunization record. And I think that will minimize. And now that I have the floor, another thing that we could avoid is, you and I know, everyone know, everybody knows that one of the critical factors because of this unvax believers is because of the misinformation and disinformation. And I think if we could, we could counter the misinformation that's at hand, you know, where did you get your information? Because people will just believe social media is such a powerful platform. And if we could counter it on TV, I know it's expensive, Governor, but I think it's the, the, one of the reasons why people believe the things that they believe is because they don't have the facts from the misinformation are uh, all cleared. And um, so the sporting event concerts, the governor, I would, you know, T-Mobile is such a powerful event center. Mm -hmm. And if we would do what Allegiant does, then 
I think it will minimize because there's a lot of people from out of state. California, I, I saw someone, a couple, California, Colorado, Utah, they were not wearing masks, but they have a drink in their hands. I want to make sure we come over here, but Governor, we are running a little short on time, so maybe if we come over here, and then if you want to make some closing remarks. So, um, Governor, my suggestion is the availability of the vaccine, um, because I work in a clinic, and um, some 75 years old, 85 comes in, but we don't have. So I tell them, okay, go across the street to go all greens or CVS. So I think that will uh, have an impact if we have availability in the clinics. Okay, what kind of clinic is it that you? I work at UNC Summerlin Clinic. <laughs> <laughs> we, will, UNC? we will make sure we get vaccines. If you can get with Megan, there's no excuse why we don't have vaccines in clinics. That we can fix real quickly. So Megan, if you follow up on that, please. I'll get my card for you. Okay, Governor, uh, just to uh, second what they're saying, like the concerts. Uh, my wife and I went to a concert before, uh, just last month. Uh, it, it says they're mandated to wear masks, but as soon as they go in, they already take, uh, they take off their yeah. masks. Even if they're not, uh, uh, they don't have the drinks or anything, and nobody is really uh, okay. paying attention and there's a lot of people that are like enforcing it. There, there's nobody enforcing inside <laughs> yeah. the thing, yeah. but in, inside the concert, but outside say they're mandated. Yeah. Even in restaurants, I just want to uh, throw them under the bus. <laughs> uh, like, they belong there if they're not mandated. <laughs> <laughs> no, not like Texas to Brazil. We went there one time. Uh, it says they're uh, oh. mass is ma ma uh, mandatory, right? Mm -hmm. To wear masks. And then people are like get, going to the uh, buffet without a mask. So I asked the guy. I thought it's like mandated when you wear, a, you know, when you go, uh, when you get take it. some food, get some food from the buffet. And he, he said, "Oh, I'm sorry. We we're, we're not, we cannot force them to do it." But I just tur uh, turned the sign to him. What is this? It's all it says mandated. And then uh, and my my son just pulled me away. <laughs> I just want to you know. It, it, My daughters do that to me a lot. <laughs> but you're right. You're right. Uh, I appreciate those are some great ideas, and I think we can take something from this. And the story with the five siblings, I'm going to tell that story. I mean, that's just, that's something that should yes. cut through yes. the, the clutter that exists on the, between the car ads and the soda pop and insurance and everything else that's on TV. That's something that should resonate with folks and if we're not getting vaccines into clinics we'll do better uh, I will talk to my team about the large gatherings you know we, we uh, work closely with the Legion to get them um, to mandate masks but they're only doing it for Raiders games they're not doing it for all the other things at all. and I'm gonna give with my team when I go back that that's viewed as such a high sensitive area I know it is a uh, tough spot for our front-end workers, you know, for the person at the restaurant to have to go up and say, would you put your mask on? I mean, they get hollered at, they get sworn at, they throw yeah. stuff at them. Yeah. Uh, I fly a lot now back and forth to Reno and Carson City here, and we had a flight attendant that was just terrific. I mean, she got on, she said, hey, look, you gotta wear a mask, it's the law. If you don't want them to wear a mask, get off before you shut the door, because you can't Take it off the whole time when you're sipping on your soda or your coffee or eating your little pretzels. You, know, you got to eat and put the mask back on or drink and put the mask back on. On planes, people are better, but I feel bad the enforcement part, whether it's a flight attendant or a waiter, waitress type or clerk in the store, I've seen them where they go up to people and say, you know, man, the rule is you have to wear a mask and they take a bunch of guff from people. And that's not right either. That's just, uh, we've lost some common decency and, and, and civility, unfortunately, as a result of the pandemic. But uh, let me close with this. You are uh, part of what's the best that's come out of the pandemic. We've been, I really believe that this pandemic has shown us the best and the worst of people. You've got people that are providing health care, making masks, uh, you know, doing the best things, serving people with food, providing food, and uh, leaving packages at doors. I mean, you've seen the angels come out, you know, as a result of this, and then you've seen the worst. The people that just don't want to follow any of the rules, that don't care, that believe that this is a uh, conspiracy, and 
that the vaccine is injecting people with chips that are monitoring them and they're going to lose their fertility and you know it's it's crazy and uh, the disinformation and misinformation that is being spread is terrible it is costing lives and like i said we've lost almost eight thousand in nevada and we'll go over that total by the end of the year unfortunately and we need to do more to get out in front of this because the virus is a lot smarter than we are it keeps reinventing itself and what they call it, mutating itself in science and when i get on the calls with the doctors and the scientists they say that this is just this uh a micro one that's uh, out there now is just going to be the next one there's going to be one coming after that and until we get the vaccines not just here in all the countries where that we can protect people and i think it's incumbent by the countries that are more financially able to provide vaccines for the countries that aren't so that we can stop it spreading there too and get people uh, I know Father Manny's always told me about the Philippines that you know it, we got to help because they don't have the resources and yes. Father Manny can make a good case so um, <laughs> uh, but thank you for all that you're doing uh, I sincerely appreciate you and everything that you've done and rest assured that we're continue to do everything we possibly can to uh, assist you along the way, and God bless you for the work that you do. So thank you all very much for having me. Do you want to do a photo with your stand-up yeah. okay. it, It's really humbling, and I mean that when I say it, to be here with these nurses, and you see the work and the sacrifices that made for the last 20 months throughout this pandemic. And as I say, the pandemic has brought out the best and the worst of people, and this is the best of people. Uh, these nurses have been on the front line, they've been providing, you know, uh, testing, they've provided vaccines, provided care, they've provided food for folks, they've done everything we've asked of them. And the toll that it has taken on the nursing community is enormous. The PTSD that's come about as a result of this, the, uh, those that have left the entire profession that just can't take it anymore. Uh, they're working extended shifts, they're very conscious of not bringing the virus home to their families, they've got to live with that. Uh, they've made remarkable strides in terms of keeping people alive and when you see the stories that they have to do with the one woman that said that their one family lost five five siblings together lost three died at one time and two died a week later it's just to think that they all didn't want to get vaccinated they decided against it and wiped out an entire family and these nurses see the front line and that's their biggest thing when they ask what we can do better is get more vaccines in people's arms uh, I don't know how we do it. They had some suggestions. I'm going to take those back to my team and see if we can implement any of those uh, to make a difference. But that is what we're dealing with here. This is a pandemic of the unvaccinated at this point. We just need to get more people vaccinated. The challenge at the beginning of it was much like the challenges everybody ran into is providing PPEs for uh, these folks in the in the in the nurse in the hospitals. Uh, we also were in the middle of contract negotiations, pretty much for all of our contracts across the state. And we uh, had to suspend those contracts and then pick them back up when the pandemic kind of subsided a little bit. But, uh, you know, mostly the, the, the PEEs was the major concern um, for, for the nurses out there and just making sure they're in a safe workplace every day. Absolutely. Well, thank you for that, Mr. Kerry, Kevin. And we'd like to thank again the SEIU. I know many of our members are also members of the union. So we thank you for all you do. And thanks again for hosting us today. Okay. Well, that was a very exciting event that took place. We would like to thank Governor Sisolak and his uh, staff in making this happen, in making it a point for him to visit the Philippine Nurses Association of Nevada and see what we had done for the community and healthcare in this pandemic. We would also want to continue to thank him for following the science, the medical science, in making decisions in this COVID pandemic, although they are very hard decisions and very tough for a leader like him, he certainly did the right thing. That Nevada is not in a dire, more dire straits than other states in regards to this pandemic. So thank you so much again, Philippine NARS listeners and followers for uh, tuning in tonight. And I hope you are still you know, staying safe out there. Uh, this pandemic is definitely not over. We now have a new variant called the Omicron variant. And so that's another thing that we probably have to deal with. But thank you for listening. This is Doris Bauer. 
thank you for the privilege of your time. And I'm signing off now. Till next time. The Philippine Nurses Association of Nevada has just brought you Philippine Nars, news and features about the Filipino-American nursing community and beyond. Fridays, 7 p.m. on PHLV Radio.